Welcome back to my channel. And if you are visiting this channel for the first time, you are also highly welcome. In this lecture, we'll be looking at the ovary. The ovary is one of the female reproductive organs and is responsible for the production of ovum or an egg. So write down with me as I describe the anatomy of the ovary. as we've said, is the female reproductive organ. We have two ovaries and they are nodular structures or bodies that are situated or located on each side of the uterus. So this is where we have the configuration of the female reproductive system here. This is where we have the uterus here, arrowed in yellow. And of course, we have tubular extensions from the uterus that runs laterally, and these are referred to as the ovidot or the uterine tube. They can also be referred to as the fallopian tube. We have two of this structure we have one on this side and we have another one on the other side and this is what is arrowed here in blue at the terminal end of the fallopian tube we have the ovary and this is where the ovary is placed here and this is the structure here arrowed in blue we have two we have one on this side and we also have another one on the other side so if you look at it you see that the ovary is located around the terminal portion of the uterine tube and this is what is presented here in this image but it is important for us to note that the ovary is not structurally attached to the terminal end of the uterine tube, even though it is closely positioned to it. So it's good for us to establish this fact. If you look at the ovary here, you see that it is located very close to the terminal portion of the ovidot or the uterine tube. So that when ovulation occurs, as the egg is released, it is taken in into the lumen of the fallopian tube or the uterine tube. So there is a suctioning mechanism that is put in place by this terminal end of the ovidot, which of course is referred to as the film brain that tends to suck up the released egg as soon as ovulation occurs. But it's good for us to know that this ovary is not structurally connected to the ovidot. Because when ovulation occurs, that could be the displacement of the released egg into the pelvic cavity. But because of the suctioning mechanism that is put in place by the film gray of the ovidot, it sucks it up as soon as the egg is released. And of course, this is under hormonal influence. So it's good for us to establish the mechanism that occur during the process of ovulation because we say that the ovary is not structurally connected to the terminal part of the ovidot, which is the fimbrae. But of course, it is closely positioned to it. So let's say this is the ovary and this is the terminal end of the ovidot, which is a finger-like expression that is referred to as the fimbrae. It is located very close to it, but not structurally connected to it. So that as soon as the egg is released from the ovary, it is sucked up into the lumen of the fallopian tube. And that is what is established around this space. If you look at this image down here to further establish the fact that the ovary is not structurally connected to the fimbrae of the ovidot, if you look at this image here, this is where we have the ovary here, harrowed in purple. And if you look at it, this is where we have the uterine tube that is harrowed here in gray. The terminal end of the uterine tube will have finger-like expression, which are referred to as the fimbrae. And this is what is also harrowed here in gray. These are finger-like expression that enhances or allows the process of functioning mechanism to occur at the point of ovulation. So that as soon as the egg is released at this point, it is sucked in into the lumen here of the uterine tube. And this is what is established here around this region. You can see that there is a space created between the ovary and the fimbrae of the uterine tube. So generally, the ovary is ovoid in shape and it is grayish pink in living subjects. This color, of course, tends to change as reproductive processes commence. So for women that are of reproductive age, the color of the ovary tends to change for being grayish pink to being grayish in color. So there's going to be a change in color because of the processes that will be initiated for reproduction to be established. Each of the ovaries weighs about two to 3.5 grams 
and the length of the ovary is about three centimeters, while the width is about 2.5 centimeters, and the thickness is about 1.5 centimeters. So let's look at the functions of the ovary. We already established that the ovary is responsible for the production of ova, and this production, of course, occurs through the process of folliculogenesis. Folliculogenesis is the process whereby the ovarian follicle begins to grow and develop into the mature graphia stage. And this is what is released at the point of ovulation. So after the process of follicular genesis and the growth and maturation of the ovarian follicle has gotten to the mature stage, the process of ovulation will be initiated. So the ovary is known to produce ova or the eggs. It's also responsible for the production or the secretion of hormones. And the hormones produced by the ovary include estrogen. Estrogen is produced by the cellular configuration of the ovary. And of course, this is responsible for the development of sexual characteristics in female. It's also responsible for the production of progesterone. Progesterone is also referred to as a pregnancy hormone, and it is used to maintain and sustain pregnancy. It's good for us to note that the production of estrogen and progesterone by the ovary is under the influence of the pituitary gonadotropins hormone. These gonadotropins are basically follicle-stimulating hormone and lichenizing hormone. These two hormones are produced by the pituitary gland, which of course is located within the central nervous system. And this is released directly into the bloodstream where they will be exerting their effect on the ovary to then produce estrogen and progesterone. You can see the endocrine impact on the ovary in the process of secreting hormones. So we have hormones secreted by the pituitary gland in the brain, and this then acts on the ovary, which is stimulated to produce estrogen and also progesterone. So let's look at this fact that is important for us to know. We know that we have two ovaries. So how does the process of ovulation occur between these two ovaries? Usually what happens is that each ovary takes turn every month so that in a particular month, if one ovary produces the egg, the following month, the production of egg will be taken up by the second ovary. However, there are cases whereby the ovary is absent. Maybe it's been taken off due to infection or some other circumstances that could warrant the ovary to be removed. Or even when there is a dysfunctional ovary, the ovary that is available will continue to produce the egg. So let's drive further on the process of ovulation. Ovulation, we say that it is the release of a mature egg by the ovary. So if you look at this image here, this is the point where we have the release of the mature egg. And this usually occur at the middle of the 28 days menstrual cycle. The menstrual cycle is a duration that occurs from one menstruation to the other. From one menstrual period to the other, a cycle is completed. This usually takes about 28 days. So if you look at this image, you have the menstrual cycle here, highlighted in blue. And of course, this is a 28 day cycle. So within this cycle, at about the middle or the 14th day of the 28 days menstrual cycle, we have the process of ovulation initiated. So ovulation is going to occur within the menstrual cycle and this usually occurs around the middle of the 28 days menstrual cycle. And of course the process of ovulation does not just occur, it occurs under regulated hormonal influences. So what initiates the process of ovulation? We are going to be taking it back to the root of how the process of ovulation is initiated if you look at this configuration here, this is where we have the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is one of the structural components of the diencephalon. And of course, we have the pituitary gland. And this is the pituitary gland here, highlighted in blue, which of course is also related or closely positioned to the hypothalamus. But specifically, is the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. We know that the pituitary gland has an anterior lobe and also the posterior lobe. But in this regard, it is the anterior lobe that we would be focusing on because this is the lobe that produces the hormone that is relevant for the process of ovulation. So we have the hypothalamus here, up here, I like Ted here in pink, and we have the pituitary gland here, I like Ted in blue. The hypothalamus 
is known to produce gonadotropin releasing hormone. This gonadotropin releasing hormone, all we need to do mostly, as I've always said on this channel, is to break the name down. Gonadotropin releasing hormone. It means the hormone that stimulates the release of gonadotropin. And that is why it is so named gonadotropin releasing hormone. So this hormone is produced by the hypothalamus and it is released into the bloodstream. Because the hypothalamus is an endocrine gland that releases its content directly into the bloodstream. And this is taken up or targeted on the pituitary gland. So as it produces the gonadotropin releasing hormone, it is targeted by the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland will then begin to initiate the production of gonadotropins. And the gonadotropin is basically a follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. This hormone also is released directly into the bloodstream because it is an endocrine type of gland. They do not have dog they are dotless. So whatever it is that they produce is released directly into the bloodstream. And this, of course, is also targeted on the ovary. So the follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone will be targeted on the ovary. So the effect of this hormone will be exerted on the ovary. And this is what is parodied here in red. So the ovary will now utilize the follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone to initiate the process of folliculogenesis. Folliculogenesis basically is the transformation or the growth pattern and development that occur with ovarian follicle being transformed into a mature or a graphian ovarian follicle. So if you look at this image down here, this is what is seen within the ovary. This is the cortical region at the peripheral side. Why deep at the central part, we have the medullar region. So at the cortical part of the ovary, we have follicles growing. And finally, we have the graphene or the mature ovarian follicle. At this stage of development, this is the final and the mature stage of ovarian follicle that is then ready to be ovulated. Then what now initiates the process of ovulation? So ovulation will occur also under the influence of hormone. Because we say that as the ovarian follicles begins to grow under the influence of the follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And if we go back to our previous slide, when we started this lecture, in trying to highlight the different functions of the ovary, we highlighted the fact that the ovary is also responsible for the production of estrogen. This estrogen will be produced because of the developmental pattern of the ovarian follicle. So as this follicle begins to develop, there's going to be the increase and the proliferation of cells. Of course, there's going to be the increase also in the mass of the ovarian follicle. And as this increases, also the production of estrogen will also increase. And at this final terminal stage, when the ovary has attained its mature configuration, the secretion of estrogen will be at its peak. So there's going to be the peak in the secretion of estrogen. And this is what would trigger the surge in luteinizing hormone. So as we have this modulation effect between estrogen and also luteinizing hormone, there's going to be the initiation of ovulation. So at this point, the surge in luteinizing hormone will initiate the release of the hair. And this is what is harrowed here in purple. As a result of increase in estrogen, that of course will lead to a surge in luteinizing hormone. So you can see how this is established. Having feedback mechanism from the hypothalamus up here, which of course will exert effect through its hormones that it secretes on the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland also secreting gonadotropins, which are basically LH and FSH, having impact also on the ovary to initiate the process of ovulation. So let's go through this fact before we actually drive in into the morphology of the ovary. We say that the ovaries are analog of the testes in male. And this is so because both are gonads, they are responsible for the production of the sex gametes. For the female, it is responsible for the production of ova, while for the male, it is responsible for the production of the spermatozoa. And of course, these two glands are also responsible for the production of hormones. For the female, it is responsible for the production of estrogen, while the male, it is responsible for the production of testosterone. You can see that the ovaries and the testes have similarities in terms of what they produce. So we're just driving into the location of the ovary, and this slide will be establishing the specific location 
of the ovary. The ovary is seen to be located within the ovarian fossa, and the ovarian fossa is an indentation that is created on the lateral wall of the pelvic cavity. If you try to use this image up here, this is where we have the ovary here, arrowed in black. We say that the ovary is located within the ovarian fossa. So this ovary is seen to be positioned within the ovarian fossa. So you have one on one side, and you also have another one on the other side. We try to use this image down here. This is the configuration of the pelvic of a cavity, and we say that the ovarian fossa is seen as an indentation on the lateral wall of the pelvic cavity, and this is what is highlighted here in this image. So you have one on the right side, and you also have another one on the left side. So this indentation created as ovarian fossa is created to accommodate the ovary, and this ovarian fossa is also seen to be related to the fimbriae of the uterine tube. We know that the uterus is seen to have tubular extensions, which are referred to as the uterine tube. And at the terminal region of the uterine tube, we have finger-like expressions. These finger-like expressions are closely related to the ovarian fossa, and of course are closely related to the ovary that is embedded within it, but it is not structurally connected with it. So if we use this image down here, this is where we have the uterus. And the uterus is seen to present tubular extensions on both sides. And this is where you have the extension here, highlighted in blue. And these are referred to as the uterine tube or the fallopian tube. At the terminal end, you have this finger-like expression. These expressions are closely related to the ovarian fossa. And as such, will also be closely related to the ovary that is contained within it, but it is not structurally connected to the ovary. So it's good for us to establish this fact. So let's try and go further to establish the structures that are seen to border the ovarian fossa. And in establishing this, it is good for us to drive into the structures that are located around it. So if you try to use this image down here, this is where we have the ichorus, and we have tubular extensions on both sides, which are referred to as the ichorine tube. We have one on the right, and we have another one on the left. At the anterior part or anterior region of the ichorus, we have the urinary bladder. And this is what is seen to be highlighted here in white. While behind the ichorus, we have the rectum, and this is what is seen to be highlighted here in green. So if you use this hopper image here, in the anterior side, we say we have the urinary bladder, and this is what is seen also to be harrowed here in white. Why behind we have the rectum, and this is what is also seen to be harrowed here. So these are the structures that are seen around the ovary. So now driving in into the structures that are related to the ovarian fossa. So the ovarian fossa, posteriorly, we have the erector. So if you try to go back to this lower image, remember in the anterior part, we say we have the urinary bladder, and the urinary bladder will receive the erector. And this is what is seen to be highlighted here in white. You have two. We have one on the right, and we have another on the left. And this erector are seen to enter into the urinary bladder at the posterior part. Of course, we know that the erector carries urine that is produced in the kidney, and of course, enters it into the urinary bladder where it will be temporarily stored. And if you go back to the position of the kidney, we say that the kidney is positioned in the posterior abdominal wall. So if the kidneys position in the posterior abdominal wall, and you have an extension from that region, which is the ureter, carrying urine that is produced in the kidney, of course, going to be stored in the urinary bladder. And if you imagine this scenario of the kidney being positioned in the posterior abdominal wall, and the emergence of the ureter from that region, you see that the ureter will be posteriorly related to the ovarian fossa. So posteriorly, the erector is seen to be related to the ovarian fossa. Also, we have the internal iliac artery. The internal iliac artery is also seen to be related to the ovarian fossa around its posterior border. So if you look at this lower image, this is where we have the abdominal aorta. The abdominal aorta at this level is seen to bifurcate into the right common iliac artery and the left common iliac artery. The right and the left common iliac artery will further subdivide into the external iliac that is highlighted here in yellow and also the internal iliac here that is highlighted here in black. If you look at the course that the internal iliac runs, you see that it is positioned around the posterior border of the ovarian fossa. So apart from the ureter, the internal iliac artery is also seen to be positioned posteriorly 
to the ovarian fossa. So when you try to describe structures that are located at the posterior border of the ovarian fossa, we have the erector that is elected here in white, and we've tried to justify the reason behind that position. And also the internal iliac artery, also elected in brown. So you see that these two structures are located at the posterior border of the ovarian fossa. Then superiorly or above the ovarian fossa, we have the external iliac artery. If you go back to the emergence of the external iliac artery from the common iliac, we say that the external iliac is what is seen here to be elected here in yellow. And as it emerges from the common iliac, you see it parting above or superior to the ovarian fossa. Then anteriorly, we have the obliterated umbilical artery. The obliterated umbilical artery is an emergence from the internal iliac artery, and this is what is seen to be elected here in black. This obliterated umbilical artery is a functional artery during the development of form, and after birth, it becomes obliterated. Of course, an emergence of the internal iliac artery. And as it emerges from there, you see it positioned around the anterior border of the ovarian fossa. So the ovarian fossa is related to these structures as we have highlighted. And if these structures are related to the ovarian fossa, it also means that the ovary that is contained within the ovarian fossa will also be related to these structures in the same format. So let's look at the position of the ovary. The position of the ovary is seen to vary in nulliparous women and also multiparous women. The nulliparous women basically are women that have not given birth, while multiparous women are women that have given multiple births. And of course, the orientation of the ovary is different in both scenarios. So if you look at the nulliparous women, the position of the ovary in this women is directed almost vertically. So this is how it is positioned here in this image. It is almost directed along the vertical plane. And also the surface of the ovary of women that have not given birth also appears to be smooth. So looking at the multiparous women, which are women that have given multiple births, this is the configuration here of the ovary. It is aligned along the horizontal plane. Also, the surface of the ovary of women that have given multiple beds appears to be rough. So when you compare the surfaces in terms of being smooth and rough, they are different. Also, the orientation of the positions also are different. So this is how the changes occur in terms of orientation and, of course, in terms of the surface. And this basically is attributed to the fact that in multiparous women, there is the enlargement of the uterus. And when the enlargement of the uterus occurs, there's going to be the pull of the uterovarian ligament towards the uterus because of the increase in the size of the uterus. This is where we have the uterovarian ligament. We say that what we need to do mostly is to break down the name. The uterovarian ligament is a ligament that connects the uterus with the ovary. So when there is increase or the enlargement of the uterus, this uterovarian ligament will be put towards the uterus and this will tend to change the orientation for being placed along the vertical to being directed along the horizontal. There's going to be the displacement, and this is attributed to the pulling of the terovarian ligament towards the uterus. So let's look at the structure of the ovary. Basically, the structure of the ovary is established based on the alignment that it forms. If you look at the ovary, it's seen to have two surfaces. It's also seen to have two borders, and also it is seen to have two extremities or holes. And this is established based on the orientation that the ovary take within the pelvic cavity. So the ovary is seen to be positioned horizontally with surfaces directed medially and also laterally. So this is the way it is placed in horizontal plane. Then you have two surfaces. One is directed towards the medial side and another one is directed towards the lateral side. So because of this orientation, the ovary is seen to have two surfaces two borders, and also two extremities or holes. So we see that everything about the ovaries are in twos. So we are going to be driving it into each of these to really establish specifically how the orientation are seen. So going to the surfaces, we say that we have two surfaces. We have the lateral or the peritoneal surface. This surface, as the name implies, is directed laterally, and this is what is harrowed here in red. You can see that it is directed towards the lateral wall of the pelvis. It is also referred to as the peritoneal surface because it is related to the peritoneum. And we have the medial surface, which is directed medially. This is where we have the medial surface that is directed towards the median plane. 
just as the name implies, this medial surface is also referred to as the uterine surface. Because if you look at it, it is directed towards the uterus. So this surface is in contact or related to the uterus. And that is why it is also referred to as the uterine surface. So these are the two surfaces that the ovary presents. Looking at the borders, we say that the ovary also has two borders. We already said that everything about the ovaries are in two. So it has two surfaces, it has two borders. Before we draw Driving into the borders, let's look at the relationship that the ovary has with the peritoneum. So you see that the entire surface of the ovary is covered with peritoneum, except at its anterior border. This is where we have the ovary here, herald in red. And if you look through this image, you see that the peritoneum is covering the entire surface of the ovary, except at its anterior border. So let's try and use this image down here. Let's say this is where we have the ovary here, highlighted in blue. And you have peritoneum covering surrounding the entire, aligning with the entire surface of the ovary except at this region here, which is the anterior border. So it is through this anterior border that we have the formation or the emergence of the mesentery because of the fact that the peritoneum is not seen at this anterior border. So this leads to the emergence of the mesovarium, which of course is the mesentery of the ovary. So this is the posterior border behind, and here is the anterior border. If you look at the anterior border, it is not covered by peritoneum. And because of this, you then have the emergence of the mesentery. So we have two borders. We have the anterior border. This is the anterior border here at the front. The anterior border is also referred to as the mesovarian border. And it is so referred to as the mesovarian border because it is at this point that we have the emergence of the mesovarium, which is the mesentery of the ovary. So if you look at the anterior border here, you have this structure. Anterior border is not only seen to be directed anteriorly, it is also around this border that we have the emergence of the mesentery through which vessels will pass through. It is through this anterior border that you have neurovascular bundles so running to and fro to supply the ovary and also draining content from the ovary. So this is what the anterior border tends to establish by creating the emergence of the mesentery around the anterior border. When you have the posterior border behind here yeah, that tends to be free, looking at the extremities, the extremities are also referred to as the poles. We also have two. The first one is the tubal extremity. The tubal extremity is seen to be directed laterally, and this is where we have the tubal extremity here. It is tubal because it is related to the uterine tube. And if you look at it, you see that the uterine tube are actually located at this other end. And this tubal extremity is also referred to as the upper pole. The upper pole is as a result of the initial position of the ovary before childbirth process commences. Because we tried to establish this in our previous slide, trying to establish the differences in the orientation in terms of position of how the ovaries are placed between nulliparous women and also multiparous women. So if you look at it, this is the initial orientation before childbirth process commences. And if you look at it, it is directed almost along the vertical orientation. And this upper part here is where we have the upper pole. It is this upper pole that is further transformed into the tubal extremity. Because we say that we have the uterovarian ligament that tends to hold the ovary and support or connect it with the uterus. And due to the expansion of the uterus, there's going to be the pulling of this uterovarian ligament towards the uterus, thereby changing the orientation. So if this ovary in nulliparous women that is directed vertically or almost vertically is then dragged plane, there's going to be the repositioning of the upper pole towards the tubal extremity. And that is why the tubal extremity is also referred to as the upper pole of the ovary. So that can be used to explain how this name emerges. Because this point that is harrowed here as the upper pole, will finally be positioned and directed towards the uterine tube. And this is referred to as the tubal extremity. So this is how the direction goes from being vertically placed to being horizontally placed. So you have the upper pole being directed towards the tubal extremity. And we say that this 
tuba extremity or the upper pole appears to be broader because it is at this point that we have the release of a mature egg. If you look at the way it is placed, we know that it is placed close to the uterine tube. And we know that the terminal end of the uterine tube, which is the fimbrae, is what sucks in the egg. So this hair needs to be broader so as to create the allowance for the mature egg to be released. Then the second extremity is the uterine extremity. And this is also referred to as the lower pole. If you look at this image up here, that is arrowed here in yellow, this is where we have the uterine extremity. This is where we have the uterus here at this region. And of course, this extremity is directed towards the uterus. And that is why it is so named the uterine extremity. This extremity is also referred to as the lower pole. And this justification will also be related to what is used in establishing the upper pole of the tuba extremity. So if you look at this image down here, this is where we have the lower pole here, carried in yellow. This lower pole is what will change the orientation and be directed towards the uterus that will then be referred to as the uterine extremity. So the uterine extremity is also referred to as the lower pole because it is actually the lower pole of the ovary that was initially in a vertical orientation that is now being directed towards the uterus. Also, this region also is established to be narrower because ovulation is not seen to occur at this point. Going back to our previous slide, where we try to establish the fact that the fimbrae, which is the terminal part of the fallopian tube, is not structurally connected to the ovary. This means that the ovary cannot just be suspended on its own. It needs to be structurally supported so that when the egg is released, it can be well positioned close to the fimbrae of the fallopian tube or the uterine tube. That is why we have ligaments that support the ovary and also helping to hold it in place. So the ligament, we have the ovarian ligament. This is also referred to as the uterovarian ligament. It can also be referred to as the proper ovarian ligament. We've said that most times all we need to do is to break down the name. The uterovarian ligament is what is seen to be hard here in black. And of course, this is seen to connect the superior angle of the uterus here with the uterine extremity or the lower pole of the ovary. We've described this in our previous slide where we try to establish the extremities and also the poles of the ovary. So this is where we have the uterine extremity or the lower pole, and this is where we have the uterus here. And at the superior angle here is where this connection is created, just behind where we have the opening of the fallopian tube. So you see the uterovarian ligament creating a structural support at this end. Then the next one is the suspensory ligament of the ovary from the names helping to suspend this ligament, of course, is seen to be harrowed here in blue. This is seen to connect the tuber extremity or the upper pole of the ovary to the lateral pelvic wall. This is where we have the tuber extremity. This is also referred to as the upper pole. So this region is connected to the lateral pelvic wall through the suspensory ligament of the ovary. The suspensory ligament of the ovary is actually an extension from the mesovarium. So we have fold of peritoneum forming the suspensory ligament. And that is why if you take a T-section of the suspensory ligament, as shown here in this image, you see vessels running through it because it is an extension from the mesovarium which we will be dwelling more on in our next slide. The mesentery of the ovary, basically we tried to describe this in our previous slide. The ovary is seen to be surrounded or lined by peritoneum. But of course, this peritoneum is not seen to cover the entire surface of the ovary. You see this deficit in the anterior part of the ovary. So we have the mesovarium as an emergence from the anterior border of the ovary. We've tried to describe this in our previous slide. This is where we say we have the ovary here, I like it blue. And if we have mesentery running through it and leaving the anterior surface uncovered, there's going to be the two layers of peritoneum at this point. And this will lead to the emergence of the mesentery. So this is where we have the posterior side that is covered by the mesentery. Also turning around, but leaving the anterior region 
to be uncovered. So this point is where we have the emergence of the mesovarium. And this is referred to as the mesentery of the ovary. And we know mesentery basically, apart from helping to support or cover the ovary, it's also creating a channel through which vessels will reach the ovary. So you have within the mesentery vessels parting to and fro to supply the ovary. And one interesting thing about the mesentery of the ovary is that it tries to link with the peritoneum covering of other organs that are located around it. And this is where it gets more interesting. Around the ovary, we have two basic structures. We have the fallopian tube and we have the uterus. This structure also have their own mesentery. And you see that the mesentery of the ovary is seen to create a link with these two mesentery. And this, of course, is also helping to create further structural support for the ovary. So at the superior part, we know that above this region, we have the fallopian tube. So superiorly, you see that the mesovarium is connected with the mesosalpines. The mesosalpines is the mesentery of the fallopian tube. This is where we have the mesentery of the ovary, which is referred to as the mesovarium. And most superiorly, we have the mesosalpines here that is harrowed in yellow. So you see that the mesovarium superiorly is connected with the mesosalpines. And of course, at the inferior part, it is also connected with the mesentery of the uterus, which is called the mesometrium. So this is what is harrowed here in red. This is the uterus at the inferior part, and this is the mesentery of the uterus. So you see that the mesovarium, which is the mesentery of the ovary, and of course, this mesentery is seen to emerge at the anterior border of the ovary. When we try to describe the border of the ovary, we already established this, and this is where you have the emergence of the mesentery. So this mesentery superiorly is connected with the mesosalpines, and inferiorly is connected with the mesometrium. And this, this structure is what is seen to form structural component of the broad ligament. The broad ligament is like a fold of wrapper that is seen to have specific regions that is related to organs around that space. And this include the ovary, the fallopian tube, and also the echeros. So we can say that structurally, the broad ligament is made up of the mesovarium, the mesosalpines, and also the mesometrium. And this, of course, is like a fold of wrapper, as we've said, helping to create structural support for the ovary, the fallopian tube, and also the echeros. So this is what the mesentery of the ovary tries to create around this point. So let's look at the blood supply. The blood supply of the ovary is from the abdominal aorta. This may sound strange, but of course, this is the basic. And this can be attributed to developmental process. We know that during the development of form, the ovary is seen to develop from the abdominal cavity. And of course, as development proceeds, there is a descent of the ovary. And this is where the ovary is further pushed to the pelvic cavity, where it is finally located or positioned. And of course, during this course, it tries to take the blood supply within the abdominal space along with it. And that is why you have the ovarian artery bring a branch of the abdominal aorta. So if you look at the configuration here, this is the abdominal cavity. Inferiorly, we have the pelvic cavity. Within the abdominal cavity is where we have the abdominal aorta. The abdominal aorta in the median region, we have the emergence of the superior mesenteric artery that is highlighted here in black. And inferiorly, we have the inferior mesenteric artery that is also highlighted in black. In between the superior and the inferior mesenteric artery, we have the emergence of the renal artery that is highlighted here in dotted red. This renal artery is going to be supplying the kidney. And inferior to the renal artery, we have the emergence of the ovarian artery that is also highlighted here in dotted red. This ovarian artery, you see it emerging from the abdominal aorta and going down to supply structure that is located within the pelvic cavity. So you see it descending down and supplying the ovary. Then also the venous drainage. So the venous drainage of the ovary on both the right side and the left side are different. And we try to establish why this is so. If you look at it, in the right side, the ovarian vein is drained directly into the inferior vena cava. If you look at the abdominal aorta here, this is where we have the right side of the abdominal aorta. This is where we have the left side. On the right side of the abdominal aorta, we have the position of the inferior vena cava. 
The inferior vena cava is the largest vein that collects the oxygenated blood from the lower part of the body. This inferior vena cava will finally make with the superior vena cava from the upper part of the body to form the vena cava, which will finally drain the oxygenated blood into the right atrium. So this is where we have the inferior vena cava here. So we have the right ovarian vein here, like head in dotted blue, draining directly into the inferior vena cava. And if you look at the position of the inferior vena cava, you can see why this is so. Then going to the left side, the left ovarian vein is first drained into the renal vein. This is where we have the renal vein here. The renal vein is then further drained into the inferior vena cava. And this can be justified by the position or the placement of the inferior vena cover. You see that it is easier on the right side to be drained directly into the inferior vena cover than to be drained on the left side directly into the inferior vena cover. So on the left side, it is initially drained into the renal vein before the renal vein then directs it into the inferior vena cover. Should be able to understand why this presentation occurred. Then going to the lymphatic drainage and also the innervation. The lymphatic drainage of the ovary is through the parietic lymph nodes, while the innervation for sympathetic innervation is through the ovarian plexus, and the parasympathetic innervation is through the pelvic splanchnic nerve. Let's look at the clinical anatomy. The first one would be the ovarian cyst. The ovarian cyst basically are fluid-filled masses that are seen within the ovary. When this becomes more than 10, it is referred to as polycystic ovary. And when you have a fluid-filled cyst located within the ovary, it tends to disrupt the process of follicular genesis, and this will result in infertility. We also have ovarian tumor. And within the ovary, of course, we know we have a number of cells, and these cells are continuously proliferating and also developing. But when this proliferation becomes out of place or becomes uncontrollable, and it also begins to occur at a very fast pace, it will lead to the formation of ovarian tumor. So there's going to be the excess production of cells, normally are seen to be benign, limited within the ovary. When they now gain the capacity to be malignant, which means that they have the capacity to run to the surrounding organ, they tend to become ovarian cancer. And of course, this will destroy the functionality of the tissues that they tend to invade. So let's check our understanding of this lecture through the following question. The first one is to describe the hormonal events that underlie ovulation. We said during the course of this lecture that ovulation does not just occur, but it occurs under regulated and coordinated hormonal events. The second question is to explain the structure of the ovary. The third question is to describe the position of the ovary and also explain how it changes after multiple births. The next question is to highlight the ligament that gives structural support to the ovary. We say that the ovary, of course, needs to be supported so that it will well positioned around the fimbriae, which is the terminal part of the ovidot. Then the last question is to explain the blood supply and also the venous drainage of the ovary. So thanks for watching this video. Let's continue to stay glued to this channel.